Good evening and welcome everyone to this uh, panel discussion on the role of uh, the relevance of hydration uh, as an adjuvant in acute illnesses. I'm Archisman Mahapatra. Uh, I'm uh, the executive director of Grid Council. I shall be moderating this session. And uh, we have uh, uh, been uh, taking, uh, discussing about this in the back end as well. But of course, we have a very fantastic panel. I, I shall be introducing that learned panel to you very shortly. Before we get into that, uh, I must uh, thank uh, the panelists who will be joining us shortly. This event is being organized by ethealthworld.com and ORSL. And the topic as we have already highlighted is hydration and acute illness. Hydration and acute illness is usually uh, overlooked. Many times it's overlooked, especially if, if the if it is about oral hydration and we shall be uh, taking, uh, discussing the nuances around it. Uh, allow me to introduce the panel to you. We have uh, Dr. Papara Nadakuduru, Consultant in Internal Medicine, Kim's Hospital, Sikandrabad. Namaskar, sir. Welcome. Welcome, sir. Dr. Harish Chafle, Consultant in Intensivist and Chest Physician, Global Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Prasoon Chatterjee, Senior Faculty, Geriatrics at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Good evening. Sir. And Dr. Preeti Thakur, uh, who is a pharmacologist, General Manager, Medical Affairs, Johnson & Johnson. Now, welcome on board, uh, dear panelists. Thank you for taking out time for this uh, interactive uh, session that we're going to have. So it'll be like uh, about 45 minutes of interaction, followed by another 15 uh, minutes of Q&A from the audience. We all know that uh, hydration is very important uh, especially when it comes to recovery. Uh, not being able to manage hydration adequately could lead to prolonged duration of uh, uh, illness. And it comes with a, a gamut of other, other complexities, uh, including, including direct and indirect costs. So the patient may need ICU uh, care, may, may, may just have a very prolonged uh, uh, morbidity. Recovery is also impacted. And indirect uh, costs are obviously there. We do not adequately discuss this in medical literature. There is some evidence about IV fluids and their uh, utility, but for oral uh, hydration management, things are a bit like unsure. Dr. Paparo, I'd, I'd like to come to you uh, 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 requesting for your views. Yes, Dr. Mahapatra. What are the basic principles when we look at uh, uh, hydration, oral hydration especially? in acute illness? Fundamentally, what the fluid we take inside and what we excrete or lose in terms of, you know, many ways needs to be balanced. This balance is essential for life. And this balance is maintained by a system called homeostatic system. So this is balanced by so many concepts. I'll be dealing a little later. And basically, yeah, the key concern is maintaining a fluid and the electrolytes, which is brought about, you know, a, 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 fundamentally there is a large system in the body called the homeostatic system, which distributes the fluid as well as the solute. And, and in any imbalance due to deprived extracellular volume, that is either blood volume or interstitial volume. So this leads to be balanced quickly and this is brought about by replenishing what is lost. So replenishing what is lost is the fundamental rule, whether it is uh, fluid, whether it is uh, or the solute. So basically maintaining a homeostatic is maintained by a few mechanisms, few concepts. One of the concept is maintaining the total body water. Now our body consists of 55 to 60% of it is water. So out of this 55 to 65, 60%, 65% of the fluid is in the interstitial compartment and 35% is in the extracellular compartment, including the blood volume. So any, any loss from the essentially from the extracellular volume is described as dehydration that should be replenished and along with the 
basic fundamentally the solute also to be balanced the sodium and extracellular volume because this leads to a balance of what is called estimated central blood volume or this is also called effective central blood volume so this effective central blood volume is required for the maintenance of the tissue perfusion for the circulation to go on and the solute to reach and to make a balance this is how the homeostatic mechanism maintains and at the same time the other things is replenishing of extracellular volume that is basically this extracellular volume to be replenished as quickly and as effectively as possible so good knowledge of pathophysiology of the underlying disease underlying condition is essential for the selection of appropriate fluid for the selection of the appropriate you know matching solutes also so this is essential for selection of the appropriate fluid and electrolytes so this is also replenishes quickly and maintains the blood volume and does the tissue perfusion keeps going so fluid at the same time fluid overload can lead to and if this fluid overload can lead to essentially pulmonary edema it can lead to congestive heart failure it can lead to uh, gastrointestinal problems and all that at the same time if the concept is not well oriented we can still under treat the patient and can still patient can have dehydration so selection of appropriate solute and fluid balance is utmost important fluid overload or fluid underload that is that is improper treatment of dehydration also has led to mortality as per many studies in the critical care setting so this is important and uh, intake output evaluation exact intake output uh, charts and uh, and this evaluation is at most important and most important of all these an estimation errors of volume evaluation or volume estimation can leads to so many problems so initial treatment or the plan of treatment depends on how best we have the eval evaluation of the or the understanding of the volume and there are certain clinical criteria also to understand the volume deficit number one if it is mild if there is no hemodynamic disturbance usually it is 50 to 100 ml per kg body weight when it is mild dehydration where the urinary output is normal where it is severe dehydration the urine output is literally uh, they will be allegoric and hemodynamically unstable systolic blood pressure will be less than 80 and these are the stages you have to give at least 100 to 150 ml per kg this is the fluid that is in general required this is a rough estimate we have also has to understand what is the fluid deficit what is the ongoing losses and how best you can manage in the given situation so uh, increasing the the fluids has problem of overload in the system and if you don't treat properly you can have Uh, improper treatment or still continue to have dehydration leading to so many tissue perfusion problems so the rehydration part should be started as soon as it is possible so uh, as we all know that once who started the oral rehydration program in the world millions and millions of children were saved on it uh, and the when it should be started as soon as possible who has to start anybody can start and it is basic understanding that one need to elaborate to understand how they can give even at a periphery level and they should start as soon as possible in any situation even somebody is continue to have fluid loss vomiting diarrhea they can still have and about 35 to 40% of deaths were prevented even in cholera so when it has to be started as soon as the fluid loss is start starts 
and it has to be replenished along with the electrolytes and solute as possible. Dr. Mahapatra. Thank you so much. Uh, within that nutshell, you, you touched upon so many issues. You gave an idea of the homeostasis, the pathophysiology behind it, and the need to carefully balance. Addict, like it should not be under hydration or over hydration. The complications are there. And uh, you, you also emphasized on the need for not just focusing on fluids, but also on electrolytes and maybe energy would be another component. Uh, and, and you also said that we do have some evidence uh, especially even at the primary level in resource constant setting, that oral rehydration initiated early and adequately can be uh, not just aiding in early recovery, but also could be life-saving. So it could just impact the overall disease. Uh, yes, Last sir. but not the least is that nutritional management. At any point, energy levels has to be maintained and particularly in a critical care setting, adequate nutrition is important at every level. And because this is primarily to meet the basic basal metabolic rate and basal metabolism of the patient, and the patient will be in catabolic state usually when they are in critical care setting. And to balance all this critical uh, condition of the patient, we have to give an extra calorie intake, which has adequate vitamins and essentially trace elements. All these are important to maintain a, a, a balance of nutrition with adequate calories carbohydrate, protein, and fats, and with essential nutrients. Dr. Mahapatra. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for clarifying on that aspect as well. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd now go to uh, Dr. Shafle. Yeah. Sir, uh, uh, Papa Rao, sir, just now uh, narrated that it's a very tightrope, the balancing between under hydration and over hydration. And uh, uh, so, so, of course, there would be like some difficulty in uh, evidence-based practice, or in standardizing uh, approaches to hydration, detecting them and uh, managing them. Of course, uh, if people are having comorbidities like diabetes and all, there would also be some guidelines around it. Sir, would you like to please reflect on these aspects? So as uh, Dr. Paparao rightly suggest, uh, rightly said, that uh, to the balancing it out is, is absolutely required. And uh, too much or, or too little, we have to uh, walk the rope properly. Because if you over seriously hydrate, then it can cause problems. If you under hydrate, then, then also there is a problem. So as we all know in diabetics, particularly this situation, whenever somebody diabetic comes to you and uh, fluid form a crucial component of management of patients who come to you. So if a diabetic comes to you with dehydration in the form of diabetic ketoacidosis. So as we all know, hydration, uh, if you hydrate them properly, in the initial part by assessing basically. So all the parameters of dehydration needs to be assessed. We have clinical parameters, we have history taking, we have background of the patient and whatever medications the patient was taking beforehand. So as we all know, hydration reduces the hyperglycemia by count, reducing the counter regulatory hormones. It enhances the renal glucose clearance and it augments the insulin sensitivity. So all these factors are very important whenever hydrating a patient with diabetes mellitus. So fluids in diabetic ketoacidosis is possible role in causation of, so uh, if, if uh, uh, the in diabetic ketoacidosis patient is not hydrated properly initially, or if it is overhydrated, you can, you can aggravate cerebral edema if you go to the other side of the curve, that is what is contemplated. Usually fluids, if you have to assess whether the patient can take fluids orally or he, he is also having situation where he is vomiting constantly and if you start replenishing through the oral way then it may not, it may not be adequate so if situation comes to that that you need to give IU fluids you should rush in with normosaline as traditional fluid of choice uh, because if you don't hydrate this patient within time there is risk of acute kidney injury because a diabetic would have an underlying uh, uh, diabetic nephropathy which is hidden inside which was still normally behaving but uh, a sudden uh, loss of volume from the body can lead to perirenal achy so we need to Concentrate on hydrating initially uh, adequately with normal saline if somebody is not able to take orally. But if you find a patient who is compass mentos, because the, uh, the compass mentos status is also important, uh, usually these diabetics, they come in a drowsy state. And even if they can drink orally, you should not give oral fluids to this patient because there is a risk of aspiration that can happen. So initial resuscitation, I would say in a diabetic, if he is not in a good conscious state, should go with IV hydration in the form of normal saline. And usually 500 ml to one liter boluses usually is what is required for them to come out of the crisis. And then you need to reassess the hydration status. 
i think uh, color of the urine assessing the color of the urine is a very good marker urine output monitoring then uh, uh, clinical markers like pulse uh, your respiratory rate blood pressure uh, keeping a urine output having the uh, seeing the color of the urine as well as uh, see the, uh, the the capillary of the nail bed refill require uh, that time has to be monitored properly that will also give you a fair amount of idea skin turgor as a marker for dehydration in elderly is very uh, i think uh, the other speaker would throw highlight whenever we uh, discuss about geriatrics and dehydration in that so uh, so as we all know this hydration they causes reduction in the counter regulatory hormones and uh, increases the renal glucose clearance and that is how in the, the diabetic patients hydration is very important and uh, it should be done but it should not be over zealous after you have achieved the initial target then you need to see the requirement of the patient and give fluids as per the needs so it is said 25 to 30 once the requirement is fulfilled then 25 to 30 ml per kg per day is what what should suffice but having said this the background history is also very important for me if the diabetic has an underlying cardiac ailment if previously the 2d echo or other fractions are done you should see the ejection fraction which is done in the recent 2d echo and so it will also guide you how much you you should load this patient because i have seen if these patients are overloaded because of underlying uh, cardiac problem they can go into pulmonary edema very soon so that tight balance walking on this rope is very important particularly when you are uh, dealing with a diabetic patient and also if you are taking into consideration giving fluids as per per kg body weight you have to calculate the ideal body weight of the patient not the actual body weight of the patient because there is definitely a fallacy in uh, what is the actual body weight uh, and what is the ideal body weight for this individual so there are formulas available for that and then according to that calculation you need to give also just hydration is not important in a diabetics because uh, you have to maintain the electrolyte balance well because they tend to develop hypokalemia very frequently because uh, uh, even it is said even if your potassium levels are normal initially you should start replacing potassium till you get a lab value uh, what is there because you will be treating this diabetics with insulin insulin also causes hypokalemia and then it can further get aggravated so uh, uh, in addition to hydration i think balancing the electrolytes the, the potassium magnesium seeing the chloride levels is equally important uh well uh, well uh, when when hydrating a patient who comes to with the diabetes matters dr mohapatra describe the rescue and opti- optimization part of fluid management and stabilization of course now once that thing is already happening uh, how do you look at oral uh, hydration coming in uh, moving out from iv fluids and then yeah, moving yeah. to yeah so uh, as a maintenance thing as i explained if the patient settles down the vomiting comes down and the initial crunchy situation where you have corrected the acidosis Uh, the metabolic acidosis component basically by controlling the blood sugar as well as by giving adequate fluids so you need to uh, uh, as i said 25 to 30 ml per kg per day body weight is uh, what should be targeted and uh, uh, in addition to that you should uh, also uh, inca- calculate the ongoing losses if any from this patient so if, for example if this patient has a diarrhea or if there is a nasogastric tube aspirate that is on the higher side then i think that also should be calculated and it should be added to the replacement fluid uh, in addition to whatever orally we are giving so all these assessments uh, are very important uh, uh, whenever uh, doing these things yes uh, uh, thank you so much sir uh, thank you for highlighting the uh, intricacies of fluid management to further depth and uh, of course even the nice guidelines nice uh, guidelines yeah yeah they they also would you like to talk a bit about it so uh, national institute of uh, health and uh, care excellence has given a guideline basically and it is a very good guideline to be followed for uh, replacing the fluid basically in patients with acute illness so assessment and management of patients fluid and electrolyte as part of a ward review is very important and uh, i think all those who are managing these patients in ward or in icu should be exposed to these guidelines because guidelines will give you give you a a way to walk basically and you know what is the standardized approach in dealing uh, these guidelines and uh, so everybody should be uh, should be exposed to these guidelines actually the guidelines will tell you how to walk but then it has to be individualized whenever you are exposing getting exposed to the patients so uh, these guidelines uh, they say whenever you are prescribing fluid to any patient you should remember 5 hours that is resuscitation routine maintenance replacement redistribution and then reassessment so all these things are to be done at a regular interval gradually so that you can adequately replace as well as maintain the fluid balance of the patient so um, very nicely given in this guideline 
thank, thank you sir thank you for uh, flagging those important issues in those guidelines my basic understanding is that the guidelines would suggest uh, like uh, come out of iv fluids asap and then initiate on oral yeah so uh, thank thank you sir i'd now go to uh, dr prasoon uh, sir you are a, a senior geriatrician you would understand uh, the issues around uh, electrolyte balance uh, and the role of dehydration in the elderly population how how do you actually diagnose or manage these patients the elderly what what are the issues related to hydration in them and uh, uh, are there any particular de escalation uh, protocols that you follow or your approaches to managing them on oral fluids or the role of counseling uh, just before discharge or after discharge how do you go about elderly and hydration in acute illness thank you dr mohapatra and th- th- thanks to et um, health world and the whole team i congratulate you for uh, raising this relevant topic which is not so discussed but uh, let me tell you even uh, hydration was important for in covid management also there are a few studies which has shown that hydration was so very important even in case of covid management other than what was usual course of action so uh, when you consider for geriatric you know geriatric population are uh, too heterogeneous and uh, their life course their uh, socio economic status their morbidity profile everything is so different that every individual needs a, a, diff- a different approach i will not say different but customized approach i will say so when we are managing uh, an elderly person what we have to focus is primarily this is both for the care provider as well as for the doctor who is dealing what are the risk factor for dehydration in elderly we have to we have to be very careful like uh, one of the important thing is poor oral intake of fluid because their mechanism of thirst mechanism is uh, is little different and uh, their their the area in brain which is controlling the thirst uh, is again with aging is get deranged so they don't feel thirst unlike us uh, who are comparatively young then studies are shown female gender they are more at risk of course who are uh, very elderly in india we say 80 plus in developed nation they has they said as 85 plus they are at risk and uh, morbidity profile multi morbidity is a term which we use basically for more than one morbidity but uh, after when we deal with 80 plus patient you will see there are four or five morbidity profiles so multi morbidity is again a risk factor for a dehydration then once you have multi morbidity you will have multi well medicine we call it as polypharmacy so again that is a risk factor you have to look for that many drugs are there which causes dehydration we, we will discuss that and uh, of course someone who is bed bound for a long time he has a risk of dehydration because again you are not not moving not uh, not sweating properly so there is a chance of dehydration and uh, a few studies have shown especially in long term care setup those who cannot feed uh, themselves Uh, and impaired functional status functional status means those who cannot perform their uh, daily chores uh, like toileting bathing all these things they are at risk of uh, definitely they are at risk of um, you know dehydration and uh, any disease which causes increased increase fluid loss few disease is a very obvious fluid loss you know like diarrhea we see that there is a uh, fluid loss vomiting we see there is fluid loss but we don't understand diuresis when you are in the, under some diuretic drug like thiazide or uh, prusamide you are under diuresis the uh, diuresis so you are ha- having a higher chance of dehydration then any illness which increases urine output like as uh, doctor uh, recently unstable diabetes uncontrolled diabetes hypercalcemia hypokalemia these are are all a risk factor for dehydration so we have to be very very careful being a caregiver or a doctor now before i come to uh, uh, the how to diagnose let me tell you one thing uh, all my speaker previous speaker were also mentioning it has, it has to be very very balanced approach they are prone for hyperkalemia that is more potassium because uh, they have loss of kidney function they have loss of muscle mass they are they have lower level of renin aldosterone which is a uh, two chemical which control uh, you know k- k- potassium balance in our body they they have glucose glucose intolerance uh, which causes uh, like inability to potassium to be translocated to intracellular component potassium is basically within cell uh, uh, iron so and they uh, many uh, times uh, older people has to take multiple antihypertensive and very commonly prescribed antihypertensive for them are arb or ac inhibitor like losartan or you know um, enalapril uh, ramipril like drugs similarly they 
So one side they are prone for hyperkalemia. The other side they are prone for hypokalemia. Why they are prone for hypokalemia? Because many times they are on many medication. As I mentioned, they have diuretics. They are on diuretics. They are on poor diet. So they are and. Uh, even if they are hypokalemic, we have to very slowly correct that. That is important. Other than uh, very, very low, you have to correct it slowly. That you have to understand because uh, you, are, you, are, you have to balance with it. Similarly, they are more prone for hyponatremia. Why hyponatremia? Because they have multiple com comorbidity, as, as I mentioned. Someone has chronic heart failure. Someone has a chronic uh, liver disease we call as cirrhosis. Someone has malignancy in some form of cancer. Someone has kidney disease we call as chronic kidney disease. But most common of hyponatremia in older people are, is SIADH. That means any small, inf any infection of chest, any infection of um, uh, kidney, any infection of brain, they may present with hyponatremia. This is euvolemic hyponatremia. That means you, volume is normal, is fine in the body, in the cell, in the, uh, in the intravascular region, but uh, they have hyponatremia. Then they are, they are of ch high chance of, again, hypernatremia because their de defense mechanism against hypernatremia is thirst, which is again defective. So they don't ask for water. You have to promote water for them. So they are prone for hypernatremia. Similarly, uh, they are pr more prone for hypercalcemia because uh, many times malignancy is maximum in six, 60 plus patients, 60% malignancy. That is the prevalence. So multiple myeloma, bone metastasis, primary hyperparathyroidism, prolonged immobilization. These are all uh, make an elderly person prone for hypercalcemia. Similarly, they have they are prone for hypocalcemia because they have negative calcium balance despite normal serum calcium. So we have to be very, very critical. Any sepsis, pancreatitis, low dietary so calcium intake can lead to hypocalcemia in older adults. So regarding diagnosis, again, it is a little tricky. Unlike uh, young population, they don't complain of thirst. Uh, like uh, I'm thirsty, they, they may not complain. Uh, it is also sometimes difficult to see the skin target as uh, my previous doctor rightly mentioned, dry mouth, leaves, eyes, which is very commonly seen in uh, pediatric and adult population may not be there. But the presentation may be atypical. Like someone may complain simply of muscle weakness, lethargy, who was comfortably doing well. They may simply complain of, uh, complain of you know, dizziness, lightheadedness. Um, so, of course, uh, urine output, uh, watching urine output judiciously, measuring it judiciously, many times it helps. Uh, we uh, Some clinical signs, as a doctor, you may see reduced axillary sweating. It's difficult. Dry oral mucosa, you may see it. Darker urine, but yes, if you get recent changes in consciousness level, which we call as delirium medically, is definitely you have to look for uh, electrolyte imbalance. It, this is a rule of thumb. Infection, electrolyte infection, precipitated precip electrolyte imbalance, and this is a vicious cycle. The patient's consciousness level uh, gets, gets down and down. So we have to sometimes rely on biochemical parameter. You, you, you should look for serum osmolarity. You, you can look for serum sodium, potassium. These are easily available in most of the hospital, not in uh, tertiary care hospital. Then uh, uh, regarding uh, managing a person in a uh, hospital, of course, you have to find out the cause of uh, dehydration or electrolyte imbalance. You, target, you, you find out the cause, you manage the cause. If it is diabetes, you are managing diabetes along with you are taking care of fluid. Regarding fluid, giving IV fluid, we have to be very, very careful for elderly people because many a times they have, uh, their heart, heart is not contracting adequately, we call as dilated cardiomyopathy, chronic heart failure, which is a, many a times is a asymptomatic cases. They came to us, we saw the patient and then ultimately it is like ejection fraction that is pumping capacity is only 20%. So if you um, over uh, aggressive and uh, give fluid, he will go for heart failure. So we have to be very, very careful. One of the uh, very, I will say that way, accurate and reliable indicator is uh, checking the IVC compressibility index. Uh, if you have a um, uh, portable um, ultrasound machine in any of the department, they will come and they will guide you IVC compressibility and accordingly you give the fluid, that is the best option. But yes, if that is not available, you have to be very, very vigilant about his or her output. If required, you put the patient on catheter, look for output. Overall clinical sign, if someone was compla complaining of uh, delirious state, whether that has improved or not, you have to look for blood parameter, as I mentioned, osmolality, sodium, potassium, you, you check for that. Uh, and corrected calcium, you see, magnesium, you see, these are, these are very important things, which we see in AIMS, it is possible, but I, I understand many of the primary and secondary care center, this is not possible. But once you have an opportunity, you are seeing that patient uh, is not losing fluid anywhere. The distribution is uh, not heterogeneous. Patient is not going for heart failure. Then definitely you should try for oral 
but before you go for oral one important thing is never try oral fluid in a delirious patient there is a high chance of aspiration aspiration means fluid instead of going to stomach it is going to lungs that is actually dangerous patient in septicemia patient is uh, electrol imbalance you are basically worsening the scenario instead of helping the patient we take middle path many a times patient we put rails tube to promote enteral feeding but rails tube is also uh, you 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 should preferably uh, try iv fluid or rails tube fluid again which is a enteral fluid uh, in case the patient is delirium yes patient is not in delirium immediately you switch to oral fluid as much he can take give him his preference what are the fluid he can take as per the his disease condition so de escalation uh, protocol as such there is no protocol when to de escalate it's again a customized individualized experience based medicine because geriatric medicine in this country is comparatively new but yes as i mentioned every individual is so heterogeneous every individual is so different you cannot just customize uh, you cannot just give a protocol for elderly people when to de escalate but yes once you have the opportunity every study has shown oral fluid uh, uh, even arrives to uh, fluid and feeding uh, nutritional component which uh, my previous speaker already mentioned nutritional component taking care of me is so important and that is only possible when, when, when it is uh, through oral system but yes before you uh, switch you have to rule out that patient is not in electrolyte imbalance like hyperhyponatremia not in sepsis not uh, in heart failure not any retention not not losing fluid Uh, or or you know there are some sometimes there is silent loss which you miss many a times patient should not be in uh, sometimes like acute kidney injury going for polyuria that time you thought oh patient is passing so much of urine but still the patient needs uh, fluid support that time also so when you were giving iv fluid you always constant monitoring is the key to save the patient constant clinical monitoring constant biochemical monitoring so check for heart rate check for blood pressure capillary refilling time jbp at least you have jbp you can see the jugular venous pressure we can check that if we don't have ivc collapsed option you look for edema you look for weight every day you measure the weight you can see the there is any addition of uh, like uh, fluid or not uh, and of course fluid balance chart is very very important which usually in hospitals have uh, our nurses do that job and lab parameter as i mentioned regarding post discharge or creating awareness among the community we have to be very very vigilant about uh, managing fluid electrolyte energy balance in geriatric population take care of their fluid at least give them one and one half uh, uh, like you know uh, liter fluid per day at least don't overhydrate them i i have heard many elderly people they say i i drink 8 liter water that is too much so at least one and half liter water to two liters water whatever suits you you do that treat any morbidity you have and if before and after event you try to give them fluid like before you are doing physiotherapy or doing any form of exercise and after you are doing exercise make it a habit make it a chart that you have to take some amount of fluid give them their preferred drink some people uh, some people prefer some fruit juice try to give them fruit juice uh, homemade fruit juice some people prefer, prefer milk you try to give them milk promote drink at meal times or after meal times because that time we are little thirsty uh, many of people say no no we will have indigestion don't do that give them fluid fluid giving them fluid is is utmost important because they will not ask you and definitely you have to identify the risk elderly who are at risk as i mentioned uh, initially those who have multimorbidity those who are, those who are confused those who are uh, de- demented those who are frail those who have multimorbidity you have to pay more attention to them as a family member it is our duty and responsibility to take care of them uh, uh, to and in right time we have to send them to hospital at right time we have to talk to the doctor and and get help you have ors but yes many times um, uh, that may not help you in that case you have to take them to hospital so i think dr mohabbat sai i spend more time for so actually very okay. nicely you have a background uh, a clinician's approach to monitoring and you also highlighted issues in the geriatric population and you also connected the need to uh, be uh, like appreciate the risk stratify according to risk if possible ensure that the person receives oral hydration and you also suggested rice stew could be an alternative even if the person is delirious community based management also you highlighted so thank you so much uh, there are multiple points you touch up you touched upon now that gets us to what is the situation of evidence and what kind of issues uh, 
encompass evidence uh, uh, synthesis. So let me go to Dr. Preeti Thakur. Uh, Dr. Preeti, uh, what are your takes on uh, evidence synthesis for uh, role of? So, so the question is to Dr. Preeti now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have requested her to reflect on her views on evidence synthesis for uh, understanding the role of hydration uh, in yeah, academics. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mohapatra. And first of all, I would want to thank ET for giving me this opportunity to join the expert panel over here from healthcare. And as Dr. Prasun actually mentioned, there this is one of the rare topic where we are talking about role of oral fluid, electrolytes, and energy in various illnesses. So uh, we have heard from all the experts that you know it is really critical, important. There are three aspects that needs to be considered and needs to be managed. One is fluid, second is electrolytes, and third is the energy component. What we are having a look over here is in terms of how do we address the needs for oral fluid electrolytes and energy in various illnesses. Diarrhea is one where we all know that dehydration is something which is established and there is role for fluid administration. However, beyond diarrhea, when we look into various acute illnesses, I think this is something you know, which is evolving and little uh, unexplored. So we do have guidelines which support the recommendation. For example, there were Aspen guidelines which came in last year and they were talking about hydration and nutrition management, especially for recovery. So they really call out the impact of hydration, nutrition management and how it will help in improving the patient outcomes. There are ESPEN guidelines which support the, uh, the hydration management in geriatric patients. And similarly, as we discussed some time back, there are nice guidelines. So there is information available in various guidelines at various places. So what, uh, and there are a lot of nuances when it comes to when, uh, you know, in clinical practice, as doctors mentioned that, you know, every patient is an individual patient. So how do we really work towards putting some standards, some protocols? Can there be evidence generation? Can we identify the areas, aspects, which are you know unmet need in terms of evidence generation and try to figure out how we can partner with the HCPs, with the institutes to address these unmet need gaps? So this is something which is really going to help us to strengthen our recommendation, to build our protocols, and again, contribute to from an Indian uh, evidence generation perspective. India, the strength is we really have a lot of patients and you know that is where we can actually generate data. Real world evidence is something which is evolving and India is also catching up. We have a scope for addressing these unmet need gaps. The second aspect which I would really want to focus upon is in terms of, and again, it got mentioned by the panel some time back, having the right formulation chosen for that particular patient. It is going to be an adjuvant treatment which is being given along with the core treatment for the patient. So having the right formulation becomes really very critical, choosing as per the needs for that particular patient. We would also want to partner and understand more in terms of are there any sufficient formulations of products available? Is there a need gap in terms of products when it comes to oral fluid electrolytes and energy and how we can have through a research and development program you know, where we can address these unmet product gaps as well. So I think this is what I would want to share in terms of how we can really help in evolving this therapy area or evolving this space in terms of for oral fluid electrolytes and energy management in various patients, adult, geriatric, diabetic patients with comorbid conditions, and which is going to further help in having an impact on recovery or impact on having superior outcomes for these patients. Over to you, Dr. Mohapatra. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Preeti. It's like rounding up the discussion. We started with the basic principles and got into the uh, management for people with comorbidities, then a vulnerable population dimension, and now overall an ecosystem approach. Uh, Dr. Papara, would you like to uh, reflect on some of the aspects that uh, Dr. Preeti mentioned, the need for engagement or partnership to uh, generate more evidence on the role of hydration in acute illness. And definitely there are well-established studies earlier and it needs to be, uh, I mean, from the Indian terms, we have to evaluate certain uh, clinical research has to happen in this term to what extent is useful and who is the right patient to give what fluid. In this, we, needs, we need to evaluate, I mean, uh, certain guidelines need to be passed across to the particularly to the primary healthcare physicians uh, across the country 
I mean, who deal day in and day out with more number of dehydration patients. So uh, particularly the data, because we more or less practice the evidence base, we need to generate some evidence of how much it is useful in real terms. Definitely it's going to be useful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Shafle, would you like to add to that? Yeah, actually, uh, while dealing with uh, hydration, uh, we are a country where dehydration and uh, during very heavy summers in certain uh, parts of the country, we get patients of uh, severe dehydration. Even we have seen deaths at certain parts of the country because of uh, severe dehydration during the um, uh, summer season. So I think we all need to come up, come together and form guidelines for ourselves. We are trying to find uh, guidelines from outside, nice guidelines, ASPIR and ISPIR are giving their recommendations. But uh, I think those population in which these studies are done are different and what we have in India as a population to deal with are different. So definitely we need to formulate guidelines for ourselves uh, when the incidence of dehydration and related problems is so much high in India. I think uh, there is need of the R uh, for to take up this challenge. Uh, I would say all the medical associations of all the states, if they start developing their own protocols and uh, we as Indians develop a good guideline for ourselves, then it will definitely help reduce the morbidity and mortality of this. That's right. Uh, Dr. Papar also suggested uh, primary uh, care guidelines, standardizing them, and you are now calling for a broader engagement of other professional associations and contextualizing those guidelines. Uh, Dr. Prasoon, you are at the Apex Health Institution of our country. And you, of course, in your uh, earlier uh, uh, discussion, whatever you highlighted, you also suggested how monitoring could be adapted to local setting. Some facilities are available at AIMS, not universally available. Are you a resource constrained setting? We're taking cues of these prime management, management of Acute illness with oral hydration at the primary level, having protocols and contextualizing them. What are your takes, sir? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I support this. Uh, it is uh, um, being in AIMS, uh, you know, we have a lot of priority for evidence generation. And we, we welcome anybody who is approaching us. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Priti, I'd, uh, I'd request you, you can, uh, you can come with a formal letter. We'll definitely do this. Uh, that is, and, and uh, I'm also. Uh, part of WHO CRO, I have created a lot of module for elderly people. So this will be great. Are the people who are going to deal the patient in, and, and they have to refer or treat the patient in right time with uh, right fluid uh, and metabolites. So that is uh, very, very important. So uh, both for primary care physician, both as well as for the caregiver, we, we need to work together uh, to create evidence and, and um, ultimately the patient will be beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So generating evidence that is contextually uh, relevant, having our protocols uh, in place, and of course, some capacity building and orientation sensitization would take us a long way in managing acute illness with this kind of a simple intervention, uh, oral hydration. Uh, now, there are some questions also. We touched upon some of these aspects as we discussed. Uh, please allow me to have a look at them and uh, you can uh, volunteer or allow me to request you to respond to those questions, sir. On the Q&A tab, you can see those questions. Now, there was one question from Mr. Vijay Srirangan, and he is saying, what are fluids, if any, instead of water, acceptable? Example, juices, milk, etc. Yes, I would suggest that uh, uh, we, we should give, uh, especially for elderly people, I am expert for them. So I will comment on them. For elderly people, and I believe for anybody, in fact, even for pediatric population, if they like Ultimately, important is like uh, if you are if someone is not interested in water but interested in milk, that is uh, great because milk will also add some more minerals and uh, you know calcium is going inside, vitamin is going, protein is going. So definitely, milk will be a better choice than uh, water. So so pray, but yes, not the carbonated uh, water. Like I will not support. Uh, I I want to have any form of Sprite, Coke, anything that I will not support. Definitely, that is not going to help you. But uh, whatever uh, fruit juice you make it at home and give it uh, soup. Uh, so any form of liquid will do. If not water, even rice water, uh, a great uh, great uh, hydration support as well as you know it contains a lot of protein also. They always ask for coconuts. Yeah, coconut water is a great thing. So anything, any any uh, any any natural uh, thing, we you convert that in juice and you have it. That that's also fine. 
there are two questions one on over hydration and the other on uh, covid management so uh, i'd i'd take this both the questions to both of you uh, paparao sir and harish sir yeah covid and uh, dehydration <coughs> covid patients ha- are prone for dehydration number one because of increased breath rate number two because of persistent coughing and those who are on constant nebulizers if they are are on any niv they are prone to lose more uh, you know insensual loss number one number two they refuse they have since they have nausea or vomiting they refuse to take food and take drinks also and this is another reason they tend to be dehydrated at the same time covid virus enters into the circulation the ace2 receptors are plenty on endothelial cell and they try to shatter the endothelium and they try to enter into the cell this is the place where there will be intense inflammation and there will be fluid loss from the intravascular compartment and for all these reasons and as a, as a result the blood vessel becomes hyperviscous and there will be increased coagulation factors also like von willebrand factor factor 8 and these will increase the coagulable states and thus are responsible for increased throm- thromboembolic phenomena particularly venous thromboembolism so proper hydration well hydration state is very very important to avoid all these in in covid uh, patients and also they will have some hemodynamic disturbances and they will also have organ damages and also uh, you know shifting of compartments happens because of the steroids electrolyte imbalances and so on so proper electrolyte and fluid balance is essential in covid patients it can be in the form of uh, juice liquid water water that is acceptable and uh, and also nutritious high calorie protein food is also essential because uh, uh, the they need more immunoglobulins in the form of that and also in turn this also increase high immunoglobulins makes them more viscous and this also needs more uh, uh, fluid rehydration and all that so it is essential to avoid the basic pathophysiology that is increased venous thromboembolism is essential to maintain proper hydration among the covid patients dr mahapat thank you paparo sir uh, uh... Dr. Harish, would you like to reflect on this question or also take the other question? Uh, okay. So actually, just one thing, as we rightly say by Dr. Papara, it's a pro-thrombotic state with very high D-dimer values. So definitely, we need to maintain good hydration of the patient. Also, there is risk of acute kidney injury because of COVID virus infection itself. So in that case, also, we are giving drugs, which can also cause acute kidney injury. So in that case, also, we need to hydrate the patients properly and also... nutritional part of that is very important having a very high protein diet is important so uh, both aspects covered is absolutely i agree with you. so this was response to mr shai's questions now there is one more one from uh, is herlin what are the demerits of over hydration in normal individuals there are people who drink 6 to 7 liters of water a day dr hari should like to respond to that yeah. so uh, as rightly uh, has been described that too too little or too uh, too much is definitely harmful uh, there were incidences where uh, medical field has gone to a level where we used to go high tidal volume we used to go high calories to patients to improve we used to go high fluids but now with the research that is happening we are coming down to low tidal volume low lesser hydration because over hydration increases morbidity mortality that is what is uh, has been observed so those people who have this habit of having very high 6 to 7 liters water this is this is uh, uh, this is one entity described in medical field called as psychogenic polydipsia so where people keep on drinking glasses after glasses of water because they feel they feel that if you over hydrate yourself the body gets clean the kidney becomes all right but on the contrary when you increase your water intake the urine output also starts increasing as a response to whatever intake you are taking and there are a lot of electrolyte disbalances in there uh, the pa- patients can develop uh, because of over hydration what is called as dilutional hyponatremia there is loss of fluid uh, the electrolytes in the urine so it's usually not advisable and people should refrain from doing this because in the long run it is not going to help them thank you sir uh, can have water intoxication yes water intoxication yeah 
Dr. Preeti, there is one question maybe you'd like to take that. Is it true that a uh, body of healthy individuals will ask for water as much as it needs? Would you like to react to that? Is it always easy to monitor water uh, loss or output or requirement? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. And I think that is where if it's a normal individual, our thirst receptors work and function, you know, where there is uh, intake. So yes, if the person is normal, our body would ask for and it is critical and important for us to keep on, you know, having hydration appropriately. The pathophysiology starts and I think Dr. Paparao really explained it very nicely in terms of whenever there is any acute illness, what actually happens, there may be reduced intake there may be increased losses and that is the time you know it becomes really critical and important in terms of one how does the patient not land up into dehydration so one is avoiding dehydration and second is maintenance addressing the need for the maintenance fluids so this this becomes comes into play you know when the when there is any pathophysiology or any acute illness present thank you yes. another little thing i want to add thirst basically is an urge to drink water that's the natural call at the same time, in a, in a sickness, there are two types. One is intracellular fluid and, and uh, extracellular fluid thirst. So extracellular fluid thirst is the regular normal thirst which requires to intake of water or along with the... But intracellular thirst is what is described as hyperosmolar state, increased osmolarity. And thus there is some electrolyte imbalance that we need to check in. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Prasun, there is one question directed at you. I do not know if it is. So the question is how much the compromised hydration mechanism makes it difficult to calculate hydration plan? At what level would one be finding it very difficult to calculate hydration plan, to have a hydration plan? Maybe in, anyone? Uh, uh, no, actually, uh, well, I, I, I was seeing that question. I think Mr. Mad uh, Mr. or Mrs. Madan has wrote Dr. that Madan. question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Madan. Uh, so uh, is it like the situation of elderly, uh, he, he, he is asking like, or uh, is it like, uh, because uh, in it's any situation we can, yeah, any situation we can plan for hydration, but the time has to be right. That is important. Uh, especially uh, difficulty comes when the, someone who, who cannot express like more of dementia in late stage of dementia, it is really difficult. You have to rely on fully on your clinical expertise. Many times we don't even get uh, the information whether he has at all passed a urine or not. And if passed, how much urine he has passed is difficult. So uh, uh, at any point of time, you can plan for hydration. You can check for the parameter we mentioned. There are some clinical parameters. There are some history. And as I mentioned, uh, for AIMS, it is very easy for us to we just go for IVC compressibility and see the, the index, we check CI index, and then accordingly, if 12.45, and then you should go for IV fluid. But yes, when we are going for IV fluid, again, we have to be we have to be careful. We, have, we should check for the, his or her status, uh, cardiac status, his kidney status, and accordingly, we should go for the fluid. Now, one interesting question has come up. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prasun, sir, for yeah. responding to that question. Uh, one interesting question has come up, uh, and it's about... Uh, how do you how you interact with water sanitation and hygiene activities for prevention of infectious diseases? Uh, that's like a bit uh, a more broad spectrum question. Overall community approaches, public health approaches, mm -hmm. and where where do you fit oral rehydration into it? Maybe uh, uh, some some learnings from uh, the ORS scale out efforts could help, and of course. These are wider determinants, uh, uh, more disparate determinants, and have an impact on health. So it will require not just uh, provisioning of uh, ORS, but also uh, broader efforts at uh, increasing community awareness and uh, working on uh, issues of ensuring safe drinking water, provisioning for safe drinking water. Now, we do have uh, another uh, event coming up, and it's a fireside chat <laughs> scheduled on 29th of July. That's ORS Day. And the relevance and the topic is relevance of, of oral hydration in hospitalized patients. Maybe uh, that we, we can re ask this question there as well. Mm -hmm. So they can talk about uh, further. It's the ORS day. And I think this discussion should be uh, started in school level. Uh, uh, irrespective of the school, many schools are doing this job because health hygiene uh, should be imbibed in your uh, nature, that is, we call it a second nature. Uh, like if if I tell my um, like if I uh, if a teacher uh, every day he speaks that without cleaning your hand you cannot uh, go for lunch or dinner 
then that will automatically one day it will be a second nature that without using my hand i will not go for uh, go for food so so it has to be imbibed and whatever we learn in our school life and uh, that has maximum impact uh, so gradually and i think uh, this swachh bharat concept has also improved little bit i will not say 100% but yes that has created some impact on health and hygiene because i am i am from a, a rural um, uh, place of west bengal so even in my childhood uh, i didn't have many hygiene sense uh, especially related to you know uh, latrine and uh, uh, washing hands and all these things which has a tremendous impact but yes we have overcome many of the things uh, nowadays as compared to uh, previous generation but still it is there so it has to be imbibed in the school culture rightly said sir so it requires social behavior change management and sensitization yeah. of communities as well as sensitization mm. of primary care physicians to be able to detect dehydration early and also mm. address the root causes yeah so uh, we we are almost uh, done we have just two more minutes maybe one more quick question regarding who approved low osmolar solutions in diarrhea and acute illness anyone like to take that question like broad perspective on it or maybe we'll park that question yeah it is it is a it is a definitely a great solution and uh, all of us all the all three of us stressed upon that only that uh, we should do that and it is available readily available even in interior villages also it is available where nothing is available even if it is not available you can create it uh, partially uh, so and, and that is life saving ultimately important thing is uh, something is better than nothing even if someone has severe dehydration if he or she can drink it still still we can continue with ors and we can save the life yes so yeah uh, as dr prasoon sir told it's important to start from the school level and uh, and actually we can make it at home the ors solution how all the mothers can be easily taught take 1 liter of clean water put 6 teaspoons of sugar and half teaspoons of of salt and make it and give as soon as possible but today there is covid and covid appropriate behavior today something else could come so behaving appropriately making the next generation appropriately to suit their uh, to improve the health promotion as a primary consciousness primary level of uh, health is important for the future thank you thank you sir thank you uh, prasoon sir paparao sir and uh, harish sir uh, namaskar dr preeti any and you know it's we have not a done like one more question <laughs> <Okay. laughs> anything uh, that we missed out discussing during our uh, one hour journey together and you'd like to highlight or clarify from one another any any particular aspect right so it seems that we are done uh, for the day uh, thank you so much it's been uh, really enli- uh, enlightening sir it's been a very enriching discussion uh, uh, sir and uh, madam thank you so much for joining us and i'd request the audience to come back on 29th uh, of july uh, that's ors day and it's for a fireside chat uh, and again the topic is relevance of uh, oral hydration in hospitalized patients thank you so much thank panelists you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.